All right, you guys, you ready to smile? Everybody has their hair perfect and all that? <laughs> okay. All right, say um, Pythagorean. <laughs> Pythagorean. <laughs> no. All right, I got us. Thank you. One other thing, I'm going to be going uh, just for a second. I've got to go fix, I got to get my computer, I got to get a different computer for this so that, so when I present, I can do it from that computer. So if you see me in and out, don't mind me. Okay. okay. Thanks, Zach. Sorry, figuring out how to screen share. No problem. <laughs> can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, a prize that's available for math teachers. Uh, it's called the Rosenthal Prize. It's for innovation and inspiration in math teaching, which I think that um, PCMI is such a great place to advertise this prize. If you want this presentation, I know it's going to be available later, but there's the um, bit.ly link um, if you want to find that, that presentation. There's more about it, too. I have the link to the um, Rosenthal Prize. It's offered through the Museum of Math in New York City. The, this prize is designed to recognize and promote hands-on math teaching in upper elementary and middle school classrooms. Uh, it's a cash award, and it's for you personally. It's not for your school, and it's for a single activity. So it's, it's just an, a math activity that you have probably already done in your classroom. So the winning teachers also get to go to New York and get to share their, their lessons. You don't need to be a middle school teacher, but it should be a middle school lesson. And if you have access to middle school kids to present that lesson to. So my first thought when I read this was, um, I have nothing worth $25,000. Um, and I thought, there, there's no way. Uh, I saw this uh, on a link through Twitter, and I, my initial thought was that, yeah, this is, this is really not for me. Uh, my second thought was, uh, math teaching, really? Um, priceless, right? It, it's, it's worth more than $25,000. Actually, no, I didn't really think that. Yeah. I thought, um, how long is it going to take? And so I looked at the application and I thought, okay, so if I apply for this, how long would it really take? And, and you know, maybe it's a long shot, but if it's easy enough, I think it'll do it. So the initial application uh, for this prize, you just have to answer a series of questions. So it's really, really easy. It's mm -hmm. just a series of short responses uh, and it's, you're, you're likely, um, the applications aren't open yet. They open near the end of March and they're usually due sometime in May. I actually finished my application in one day. So I read about it and then I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just, I'll just put that in because it's so easy. Um, here, these were my questions. They might be different. Uh, I did go back and look up what my questions were. And since the applications aren't open yet, I don't really know what they are. But as I go through those questions, think if you have something that might fit in that same category. So the first question is describe an innovative activity which you implemented with your students where that activity itself illustrates a relevant mathematical concept. We've all probably done that. Um, and then it says if your activity wasn't implemented through fourth through eighth, just include a description on how it would be modified. To the age group and it's 200 words or less so it's not long so this this actual question is 56 words so like you're a fourth of the way done if you just write that much so it's small it's a small amount when you're describing that the next question was write a brief essay and it is very brief explaining how this activity represents your teaching philosophy so this is just some sort of um it's it's how we at pcmi think so this was a, a pretty this one was probably the easiest one for me to answer the next one is, is this activity original to you? Um, if so, comment on when and how you developed it, and it can be recent. Uh, if this activity is one you borrowed from another source, you can explain that. You do need to have adapted or changed the activity. You can't just do someone else's activity and submit it. Uh, they will actually Google your activity to see if other people have done it. So when you think about you know, how you're modifying and, and whether you're using somebody else's activity, they type it into Google to see what kind of results that they get. The next question is, um, imagine another teacher were trying to implement your activity in the classroom. Uh, if they start from scratch, what materials do they need? They're looking for easy materials. How much time would it take to prepare? 
and what would be the cost? They're looking for low cost um, activity materials. They actually try your activity if it gets far enough. So they'll try it to see if it works. Um, when did you start using this innovative practice in your classroom? So that's just a simple answer. Um, and then that's it. So those are that's the initial application. So it is fairly easy. It doesn't take a whole lot of time and it, it's well worth it. Um, the, there is a rubric that and it's kind of hidden information. I googled it and found it so it can be useful when you're trying to decide like if you have three or four activities like which one would be um, a great activity in order to be able to submit it. So here's the rubric. I've included it. So they, the first one is innovation and these are not all weighted equally. So innovation is a big one. Is it outside the box? Um, engagement is also a big one for them. Um, and then you can see that there's a link down here for the rubric copy uh, that has the whole rubric copy on there. Uh, what is the what is the math? So that's really important to them as well. And can can you replicate it? Uh, the last one does uh, the connectedness. So if you have something where I know the last activity had uh, some sort of light and similar um, triangles in there, if you can connect it with something else, um, they, they like that a lot. Uh, is it understandable? The last one they said is actually the least important. Is it well written? Um, just have somebody go through and, and edit it, but that they said was the least important on there. So there's this video that's on YouTube, and it's got a lot of insight as to how the process works and what the judges are looking for. Um, I'm just gonna play just a little short clip of it and then um, stop it. It's a long video, but if you're applying, it's a good one to, to kind of look through. It's an old one. are about to apply or have already applied for the Rosenthal Prize. Uh, let me introduce who you're looking at right now. Uh, to my left is Glenn Wavy, and he is president of the board of the National Museum of Mathematics and also the founder and also happens to be... So they introduce the all the judges here. Rosenthal these guys are the judges and these guys are past winners. And so they'll talk about like how their lessons were developed and then some of the judging criteria. So if you're interested in it, I would encourage you to just watch this video. I mean, it's 46 minutes, so I'm obviously not going to play the whole thing. Um, but it's, it, it is helpful in, in as you're doing your application to know what they're looking for. And then to Mary Ann's right, we have Scott Goldthorpe. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, after you do that initial application and um, you filled it in and they've looked through it and they really like what you're doing, um, they will ask you for other stuff. When they ask you for this, this other material, it's well worth it because you know you've made it far enough that, that you actually have a chance of winning. So after they look through it and they say, oh, we really like these activities, they'll ask you for a letter of recommendation, um, a video of your class. And so I videoed all six of my classes so I could get the best one because I was really nervous they weren't going to turn out well. Um, and you can borrow other classes too. I had a couple people lined up in case my classes were not, were not doing what I wanted them to do, um, just in case. Make sure you get par parent permission for that and do that kind of early in the year. So I handed that out at back to school night. You will also have a short essay as to how the lesson impacted your overall class, and it is short. So I included my essay there. It's, it's not great, um, but just so you could see an example of that. Also, a detailed lesson plan. So be really careful when you're applying for this prize, because if you look at the polished ones, it's really scary. Like I looked at them and I thought, wow, mine is nothing like this, but it becomes that. So don't let those um, intimidate you. It's, it, is, um, it is a work in progress. It takes a while for them to get to look like that. So this is a video of my class um, doing the lesson. And I'm just gonna play a little bit of it. So let's kind of go in the thick of it. And so you can see it's not like super professional. Um, somebody's like videoing me and kind of turning around. And, 
Um, I think we had like one of the test tubes break as we were doing it. So they, they're not expecting perfection. They just want to see how the activity looks and mostly like what the students are doing. They pay attention to what the students are doing. So. <laughs> And then this is another like quick video of um, another Rosenthal Prize winner and it's their activity. They're doing uh, flipping their the, a coin, heads or tails, and deciding whether to walk forwards or backwards. So this is a random walk. And um, mine is not as polished as his video was. And he's showing the normal curve how it develops from that so it's just it's a very quick activity um, it didn't take long to do but that was one of the the prize winners so my activity the one that I presented was um, okay. okay was on um, developing ratios with colors so they used colored water and then um, what does what do equivalent ratios look like for the same shade? So um, if you have 10 milliliters of blue and you have five milliliters of yellow, it's gonna make this shade of green. Well, what if you have 20 milliliters of blue? How much how much are you gonna need of the yellow? So yeah. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. Okay. Um I love this idea. Um, when do you hear? So you hear, here's the timeline. Let me go down to that. Sorry. Here's the nope, no, so that's, a, that's my last slide. So okay, perfect. the initial application is March through May. The finals notification is the beginning of school. Um, you get revisions in November. So they give you back and they say, we want this. Uh, you get notification in December and the ceremony is in January or February. Awesome. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to go too long. No, no, that's okay, very exciting. I just saw, um, I don't know if anybody remembers Matt Engel. He was at PCMI this past summer. He won the top Rosenthal Prize. He got $25,000, and Tracy, you mentioned it, for using light and similar triangles. Mm. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. I hope you win, Tracy. Oh, I did. You did who win. Yes. Yeah. Excuse me. Who was it that won last year? Matt Engel. So I won the year before, the year prior. You won the year before? Mm -hmm. The 25000 one? Mm-hmm. Awesome! And and you, you're like so humble about that. I'd be like, woohoo, look at me! <laughs> well, I think Trang won too. Trang, who was in the, yeah. one of the past yeah, weeks. Yeah, that's too. awesome. Congrats, Tracy. That's so exciting. Thanks. Is your, I didn't mean to cut you off. I cut you off right when you got to the most exciting of what was your lesson. Um, it was just, it was ratios. It was using color for ratios. So where they were mixing colors. So. And that's in your slides? Yeah, it's in my slides. Okay, awesome. And I am going to ask everybody at the end to send your slides to me, and then I'll send them all to Suzanne to get everything posted up on our timeline so everybody can see all of those on our PCMI page. Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. Oh, congrats. That's so exciting. So you won 20, in 2015. 20, yeah, the year before. So the year before. I don't know what year it is anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. All right, awesome. Okay, Christina, your turn. 10 minutes. So Tracy, can you turn off your screen sharing? Okay, can, can you guys see my stuff? Can you guys see my presentation? Yeah. Yep. Okay, yes. so my topic, great. Um, my topic is implementing IB, which is International Baccalaureate. I'm not sure how familiar people are with that, but I just wanted to talk about what my middle school does and give some specific examples and see if people had any questions about it. So um, this is my fourth year teaching sixth grade math at Albert Einstein Academies, which is a small charter school in uh, San Diego. And so I was gonna say what we did. Uh, the first thing that you can see here is from the IB website, and it just shows the continuum of programs. Most people know about the high school program because that was the first one that was developed. You can see here that it was um, in 1968 that that started, uh, but since then there has uh, been a middle years program and primary years program developed. You can see those both happened in the 90s. And uh, approximately the middle school, middle years program is sixth through 10th grade. It can be run 
um, in, a, in a smaller uh, range. For example, my school is sixth through eighth grade and we are able to run it. We don't have ninth and 10th grade. And then the primary years program um, is typically run K through fifth, like at our elementary school, but you can see the age range is three through 12 so that they can also do it even earlier than that. So um, I was gonna focus on a couple of key things. You can see on the left-hand side, right here, those are the three things that I wanted to focus on today. Um, how our program is inclusive and holistic, that connects to the whole child, which just definitely starts in the primary years program, but then also continues on into the middle years. And also how um, IB education is supposed to be relevant, those connections between studies and also to the real world, and then how it's rigorous or challenging. So the first thing, inclusive and holistic. Um, in high school, a lot of times, it's not the entire school that's IB. It's just a select group of students who opt into it. But at least at my middle school, and I'm not sure how, how much this is true, but I think there are a variety of middle schools and elementary schools where the entire school is IB. And so that makes it much more inclusive. And then also you can see in this image here, all the 10 IB learner attribute profiles. These are characteristics that we as a school emphasize and help the students to develop. Um, in sixth grade, we've chosen to give monthly awards to students who display these attributes. So there's 10 months in the school year. So each month we'll select one of these attributes and give awards to students. And we do give one to every student um, it's not supposed to be like, oh, have a trophy type of thing, but it is supposed to help every student see in themselves um, one of these attributes. So we give those throughout the year to students. And also in our math classes, we connect the attribute of the month to our unit so that we're emphasizing that within our lessons and student interactions as well. Uh, so the next thing is that IB education is relevant. And on the left right here, you see an example of one of my unit boards. It's a requirement at our school and with all IB classes, um, I believe, uh, to have a unit board for every unit that you do. And this shows the broader aims and connections of the unit so that it makes it easier to connect to other content areas and then also to the real world. So um, for us, for unit two, this is connected to the CPM curriculum, by the way. So it's statistics, arithmetic strategies, and area. And then this is all the IB stuff that goes with it. Um, the global context, orientation, and time and space, and space and time, this is kind of vague on purpose, but you'll see that the same global context, key concepts, and related content, uh, concepts exist in other content areas. So, um, Later, when you do interdisciplinary units, you are able to connect it and see those commonalities across the content areas. The statement of inquiry here is um, we're supposed to write it in such a way that it is not tied to your content area. So we shouldn't say math or anything very obviously mathy in it. This one says we can make better logical arguments by modeling information in purposeful ways. So you could see how that could be connected to an English class maybe. Um, so uh, uh, examples of interdisciplinary units, well, first of all, one is required per grade level per year. Um, one that we piloted last year was where students create solar panel models to scale, and that was through math and science class. So there's a lot more here, but that's a taste of it. And lastly, IB education is rigorous. So we give summative assessments, which are usually tests, but sometimes projects at the end of each unit. These are graded on a rubric with a rubric that's a zero to eight point scale. And seven to eight level is intended to be above grade level so that it's not just like an easy A for kids. It's really hard to get seven and eight. And so there's always additional challenge, but all levels aren't just um, giving a letter grade and that's it. And you're supposed to feel bad if you get a certain letter grade or good with another letter grade. They're supposed to be very specific with feedback. Um, you can see over here on the left, um, the basic categories, seven, eight being excellent understanding, five, six strong, which depending on the um, exam and the content area, grade level is considered somewhere between three and six um, and so on. But there's usually a lot more detailed of a rubric as well. And these are different categories that we give tests in. So we need to cover all categories, A, B, C, and D, at least once per semester. 
knowing and understanding is your tra traditional procedures and skills type of test, but all these other ones, B, C, and D, help us to um, teach students to apply math, to communicate with math, and these go along really well with the SBAC uh, claims. So it's really helping us to give students a broad math education um, in our teaching. So I know I went pretty fast, but are there any questions? I think the pacing was perfect, actually. That was awesome. Um, thank you. And I, my question is, my head is spinning because you just gave us a ton of information and I, I'm not familiar with the IB program at all. Um, and I don't teach in a, in a school that, that considers all of the things that you're talking about to the degree that you, your school does. Um, would it be weird for a teacher to request a visit? Like I teach at a public school. Could I request a visit to another school that's like an IB school to see how it works? I, I know that our school is totally open to that. Um, I'm in San Diego. I, you'd have, you're in where? I'm in Philadelphia area. I'm in New Jersey. I mean, I think a lot of schools are open to that. You would just um, want to contact them directly. As a charter school, I think we're definitely open to that because yeah, we're just more open, but you can always contact the specific school. And they all do all of these IB schools have the same type of philosophy? That's like a common philosophy or? Uh, yeah, a lot of it is. I mean, not all schools will do awards every month for the IB attributes, but all middle school programs should use the IB attributes. Um, and you can see right here, um, there's the link for the um, IB website, which gives you more information. And that first thing that I took, uh, well, basically all three areas I focused on were taken from the description and the description, which was the first page image comes from the IB website. So yes, they all should have the same philosophy. People implement it differently, but in general, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else teach at an Ivy school here? Okay. I, don't I do know. not, but I've always wanted to. Oh. <laughs> Christina, have you always taught in an Ivy or did you switch between the two? Um, I've switched. So um, I taught one year at a traditional um, high school, 11th, 12th grade kind of uh, kids mostly. And then I've taught at charter schools after that. I taught at a traditional charter school, you know, with letter grades and all that for two years and then four years here. Nice. And do you like this the best? Um, I like this the best for uh, multiple reasons, not just the fact that it's IB, but just it's a really great culture at the school where it's supportive of both students and staff. I think charter schools a lot of times can be supportive of students, but then not really care about staff, you know, work you to the bone kind of a thing. So uh, this one has a really great work-life balance and the people are awesome. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And perfect timing. Any other questions or we will move on to Sunny? Okay, so Christina, if you can turn off your screen share, and Sunny, you're up. Okay, I think I'm ready. Um, okay, and it's actually pretty, oh, this is, um, hold on, I got this, I think. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so did that share? Okay, I see lots of thumbs up. So I assume that you're seeing just the slideshow with the decahedral dice on it. Is that correct? Okay, um, so I, um, this is one of my favorite lessons that I've um, done in a variety of classes. It's great for Algebra 2, but I also use it for pre-algebra as well when we're studying probability. Um, and basically, it's a pretty simple lesson. Um, it's interesting because I was thinking when, when, the, when Tracy was doing the Rosenthal Prize um, uh, presentation, this is not a cheap lesson, especially if you want to have enough dice for, multiple, for gr small groups to, to conduct the experiment, uh, because you need 40 10-face dice for each group. Or it could be any face dice, but... 10 face dice is a nice, is a nice uh, one that you get a nice exponential curve with. And essentially you ask the students to 
um, roll their 40 10 face dice a total of 20 times. And they basically record that um, in, a, in a data sheet. So you can see there after, um, so, so I, I guess I, I gotta step back here a little bit. They don't just rolling dice after each roll. You pick a number, in this case I pick one, and they remove those without replacement at the end of each roll. And so they basically record in their data how many dice are left over after removing that particular number. And so after they do this 20 times, um, everybody in the class uh, comes up to the board, their groups come up to the board, and um, they uh, record in an Excel spreadsheet their individual um, dice remaining after each roll, and then we find a class average, which we'll put in the third column here. Um, and then the students will do a regression in order to come up with um, an equation that models our class average. And then uh, you walk them basically through a series of um, questions to help them come up with a theoretical model for it. And what I like about this particular DICE experiment is that um, it's a really good model. Like the, the what, you, what you get using a regret, what the equation you get using a regression uh, model either on the TI-84 or some other program is usually typically really close to the theoretical model that um, you should get in this case. And so, um, you know, some of the things that they do in addition to conducting the experiment, depending upon the class, um, you have them um, graph the data, talk about the different characteristics, talk about the independent versus dependent variable, variables, domain range, talk about continuity versus discreteness and oh she was being so good sorry you guys um, I was all like yes I can't believe I get to go next because she was being so good listening to all your presentations and of course now that I'm up she's kind of whining um, so it also we also talk about whether or not there's an x and a y intercept for this particular um, uh, problem and what those would mean and then, of course, they do come up with both an experimental and a theoretical model. Um, and so this is kind of the lesson that I did. And I had like basically, you know, uh, five sets of 40 dice. So it's not a cheap lesson, although the dice are not that expensive if you go through the right, the right place. Um, but I started working with one of my MAT students uh, when I used to uh, train teachers at the University of Alaska Anchorage and he was really into spreadsheets and what he did is he helped me uh, write a spreadsheet and I think what I have to do is I have to stop sharing and share and this time show you this one. Um, are you guys able to see the spreadsheet? And so he helped me um, create this spreadsheet. And on this one, you can put in that you have 10-sided dice and it'll roll it for you that many times, 20 times. It'll run the experiment uh, for you. It'll tell you um, how many uh, dice are remaining here. You can see in this column after um, each time. And this one does it 40 times, not just 20. So um, you can also do it for a different dice. And so um, you can do it for a five-sided dice. Have you guys ever seen one of those? Um, or I'm just, you know, just being a little facetious there. Um, an eight-sided dice and so on and so forth. Or you could have the kids use pennies and um, M&Ms for the uh, two-sided um, experiment. You've probably seen that done before. And you can also have this spreadsheet um, generated. And so um, all this is to say that um, it's a really fun experiment that kids get a lot out of and it helps them connect. It helps them connect some of the stuff they're doing in Algebra 2, particularly the exponential regression with an actual theoretical model that's pretty easy for students to understand because you know, with a 10-sided dice, they understand that you're, if you're only taking out one number each time, you're going to be removing about a tenth of the dice each time. And so they can see that growth uh, modeled fairly easily. Um, and let's see here. So I think I have one more slide here. 
Um, so like, like I said, you could, um, do other than you could have different groups do different, um, give them different kinds of dice. So you could give one group a 10 sided die set of 40 10 sided dice, another one, 40 M and M's, another one, 46, um, six sided dice and so on. Or you could use the spreadsheet. Um, I like the actual motion of having them use the dice because the kids really enjoy that part and it's very noisy if you have all these groups shaking the, these in a, in a box. Um, but the spreadsheet could be, can be nice to um, you know, get more data to add to your class average. Um, so that's all I have. There's my cute little puppy um, on the beach here where I live in Homer, Alaska. Um, and if you have any questions, um, let me know and I'll send the materials along to Elizabeth. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Awesome. Thanks, Sunny. That's fantastic. I like that it was using 10-sided die. I've done the exponential growth with M&Ms and exponential decay with the M&Ms, but I like seeing the change with the 10-sided dice as opposed to two-sided. Oh, thank you. Anyone else have any questions or anything for Sunny? All right, Zach, you're up. How are you doing? Is this okay? Can you see it? No, you can't. Okay, now you can. I see okay. you. I can see you right now, Zach. You can see me right now. Yeah, that's not good. You look great. Let's, let's try it. Share screen. Here we go. Here we go. I think I found it. Great. There you go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So when I came to PCMI, I'm going to share a quick story. I was um, I was inspired by what I saw. This was a really cool experience for me. Um, and when I did the morning math, the thought that, I, that came to my mind was, I need to bring this to my classroom. And I didn't know how to do that. I, I, was, I was going on uncharted territory. All I saw was 14 problem sets and said, I have to do something with this. So I won't, but I, I knew that there was, there was some kernel of truth that I wanted to find. So I just want to review with you what the morning math looked like. Uh, the morning math had these things. They had your opener, you had your important stuff, the neat stuff, and the tough stuff, right? And uh, very few people ever made it to the tough stuff. I think I made it once. I tried. <laughs> that stuff, that's tough stuff, okay? Uh, I, 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 but most of the time, I was in the important and neat stuff. Um, and, and what was really cool about it, um, I read later about how Bowen and Daryl did a really good job of making sure that we had a very scaffolded experience, that we could attack a problem that was unknown and make it known in essence. You know, we could, we could come to a consensus as a team to um, gain an understanding. In my year, it was on matrices, but on other things, you know, in other years, it's been on geometry and other things. And we took these, these topics and learned more about it. So I saw this experience as really cool because I said, okay, maybe I can do the same thing. Maybe I can bring in start the class with something really simple and build some really cool ideas. Um, what I'm going to share with you is, is some building I've built from other people's ideas and, and some inspiration I received from PD uh, that or other colleagues have talked to me about this. Um, so one, here's, here's a fault. Here's a, you know, if we, if we could have this be true all the time, all students will complete all tasks every week. I think as teachers, we know that that's not always possible. And I, I you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a sad reality that, we, we can't have students do everything every week. Um, some kids are not as able, some kids can do it, some kids you know, just need the extra support, sometimes time gets the best of them. Um, and so what I, what I wanted, you know, I had a colleague come up to me and say, you know, I structure my class this way. And this is what did it for me, this is what I saw, this is the realism. And he breaks his class down into three parts. He says 100% of my students at the end of the week should be able to do this. 70% of my students probably can handle this. And you know, for the advanced 30%, they can handle this. 
and you can probably take any sort of um, any topic. I, I'm going to use completing the square here because I'm a secondary teacher, but you can probably think of ratios, proportions. I mean, you can take anything and do it with this. Um, but I, I realized that once, once this guy said it to me, I was like, hey, you know, my class sort of fits in these groups. They sort of naturally do it. They don't, I don't have to force that. That's not something. And I, 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 hate, I, I hesitated saying this because it makes it seem like kids can't do everything. You know, I don't, I don't want to send that message that they can't do everything. But I also want to provide a challenge for those that can handle it. So sort of taking those two ideas together, here's what I came up with. Uh, for, for starters, I use a thing called MVP, Mathematics Vision Project, which is developed by the state of Utah. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Great curriculum, excellent curriculum. I'll put a link to it here, um, mathematicsvisionproject.org. You can just go there. It's for secondary one, two, and three in Utah, which is the equivalent of algebra and geometry in algebra two. So you can, you can get some really good stuff and even some pre-calculus materials in there as well. Um, really cool stuff. And it's all Creative Commons, free stuff. But what I decided to do is take some of their ideas and, and basically break um, the class into parts where you notice a pattern, then you reflect about that pattern, and then you practice the pattern. Um, I, have a, I have a few ways of doing this. So the, the noticing a pattern, that's like doing a task. Um, I, I'll show you an example, like I said, with uh, completing the square, but we use algebra tiles for that. So we'll have kids, kids just say, all right, I'm going to build x squared plus 10x plus something, and I need to make a perfect square out of that. So I have kids experiment a little bit. And then afterwards, we ask some reflection questions. Um, I use a, a learning management system called Canvas for that, but you could use a journal, you could use anything you wanted for that. And then finally, I have an online program called MathSpace, which I don't know what you're available to, but this is the equivalent of textbook problems. Um, you know, you could, you, this is where you practice the procedure, if you will, of completing the square. And this cycle continues. Um, so, you know, I'll, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, how that, how that progresses. Um, so, in, in, inspired by PCMI, I sort of, I, did, I was less creative. I didn't go with the tough stuff, the neat stuff, but I, I went more boring. Here's, here's my boring version, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but here's the basic idea. Um, level one is essentially the opener, right? It's something that everyone should be able to do. No one should feel left out. Either review material and a very brief introduction to the new material. In this case, completing the square. I'm going to use that. I'll show you a, a detailed version of this. And over the over the course of moving up each level, you do a gradually more difficult thing with completing the square. For example, maybe you have a is bigger than one. Maybe you have b is an odd number. Maybe you you do you have an incomplete square and you have to add or subtract something extra. You know that that kind of stuff. Um, and then I add an honors task because we have a we have an honors program at our school, and if you want to give somebody honors credit, that's a great way to do it. Just add a little, you know, here's here's an extra thing you can do. So here's here's an example, like and as I mentioned, here's here's some here's some practical. What does it look like? Uh, so it, it just so happened that the lesson before this was on complex numbers and rational exponents. Um, so I do a little review of that, and then we we complete the square. Like I said, you you give them something that says x squared plus 10x plus blank, fill in the blank. And we have them mess with the algebra tile, see if they can make a square out of it, ask some questions. And then I, I uh, and then we do some practice on it. Then we move on to imperfect squares, uh, completing the square where there's not, uh, where there's more than one square, right? And then finally doing it with an odd number, because then you get into decimals and kids don't like decimals. <laughs> so, you know, for those that really want to challenge themselves and really abstract the procedure, they can. And it just so happens that we had been talking about complex numbers. There's an honors thing that we do with moduli, um, the modulus of a complex number, which is basically a length. Um, that's how it looks like. And I can show you the actual, um, if you're interested in like the paper I give out to students, there's a link right here that I'll copy in. Let me copy that in the chat. So you can sort of see it. Okay. If you want to look at it, you can. Um, I'll pull it up here so you can sort of see what's going on. And I'll, I'll put the Mathematics Vision Project here, too. Hey, oops. Did I add more? Crap. Okay. There's that. Here's this.
I hope that worked. Can everybody see this? Did you get it? Okay, so you scroll down a little bit. This is all the formal mumbo jumbo. But um, what I do is I say, here's my, here's the stuff you gotta complete this week. I lay it out and say, okay, um, level one, if you are a, an honor student, you gotta do that part. And then you've got the, uh, uh, the cumulative review and complex number practice. Then we do some investigations. You notice that the building a perfect square was uh, spelled backwards here. Sort of fun. But let's get into the details. So here you go. Um, they've got some practice, review, review and practice, the um, building the perfect square, and then I have them do it backwards. See right there, I have what value of B that will make a perfect square trinomial. Um, so they have to think about the procedure a little bit. And then afterwards, I have them do a little reflection saying, okay, how does FOIL connect? Or, you know, the, I hate FOIL, sorry. The distributed property connect to, uh, <laughs> here I am using the bad lingo, right? Um, no, the, the, the distributed property, how does it connect to the expanded form? And then I ask them to write an algorithm for what they've just accomplished, right? So, and, and then I give them feedback. I'll, I'll write back to them and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, and so on. So then level two builds on it. Notice there's an almost a perfect square. I have them adjust, right? And then do a reflection. They do some math space practice on what they had just experienced um, and so on and so forth. Lest you think this is a lot of time, the thing that really takes the time is finding the tasks, right? That's why I use the MVP. That's, the, that's my go-to source. You guys probably have your own sources you go to. You can use a textbook for this. You can just chop it up into sections and say, hey, if I'm covering three sections that are all related, I could split it up in a way so that kids can attack it at different levels. And you as the teacher know, right? You know what the, uh, the, the content that's hard, the content that's easy. You can, use the, um, uh, you can use that knowledge to help develop this. That's sort of how I do it. I know what's harder and easier uh, for my students. Um, and I'll finish up. I'll finish up here. I'm just about done. Um, uh, yeah, that was the 10-minute right. timer, Zach. Yeah, I was just about to finish. I'm just like done. So um, I just thought I'll ask any questions you have. That was a lot, I know. But um, that's how I set it up. That looks awesome. And you'll send us the slides with all those links so they'll all get posted. Mm -hmm. Just send yes, that to me. Yes, all there. They're all great resources. I love the stuff. So, awesome. yeah. That was fantastic. Thanks, Zach. No problem. Okay, just try to get back on time. Abby, you're up. Okay, hello. I'm going to be doing um, mastery based grading. I'm going to try to screen share this. <clears throat> All right. So do you all see the slide that says, what is it? Okay, great. Um, so there's definitely a lot of definitions about mastery-based grading out there, and these are the three most important characteristics to me. So the first is it's based on specific learning targets. Uh, very discreet content targets. You could also do writing or reading targets. Um, we at my school do uh, democracy and work habit targets as well. And another key characteristic of mastery based grading is that there's multiple opportunities and revisions. So in a traditional assessment method, you may say the unit test is happening on March 5th, and that's the day you do it. Mastery-based grading, one of the things that is, um, different teachers do this differently, but one of the goals is to give students multiple opportunities. To, so to say, maybe you don't know whatever we're assessing on March 5th, but maybe you know it March 10th, and you should get credit for that. And then, um, it de-emphasizes percentages and points to use a smaller number scale. And different people do this differently, but my school does a scale of one to four. So if you earn a four, it means you've completely mastered the given learning target. If you've earned a three, it means you're on track, um, but there's still some misconceptions. A two means 
you've shown that you have an idea, you're starting to understand some part of the concept, and then one normally means you didn't, um, it's kind of like blank or you have no understanding of this content, learning target. So, let me go back to why, what is it? Why, okay. Um, so I teach at a transfer school, and that means that students come from places where they have to have attended another high school first. So they have a lot of anxiety about school, and school has just not been something um, that they've been successful at in the past. And a lot of students, when they receive an assessment, they are really anxious, they'll walk out of the room. Um, so this mastery-based grading is one way to reduce anxiety for students because students know that there's multiple chances, right? If you don't get it today, you can maybe get it tomorrow or the next day. And there's no penalty for getting it later. Or for my class, you can get it at the end of the semester. And once I see that you understand this learning target, you've earned a four in my grade book. Doesn't matter when or how you showed me that. Um, Another reason I really like this, and it's really shifted my classroom, is I understand more of what students know. So in my first year's teaching, I had very traditional assessments, and I would say, oh, this student got a 70% on the test, and I had no idea what that meant, or an 80% on the project. I didn't really understand what they knew or what they didn't know. Um, a lot of teachers use this with rubrics as well. And then it's easier to give feedback. So it's easier for me to know what my students are knowing and it's easier for students to know. So something I hear in my classroom often is, oh, I understand how to solve theoretical probability, but I don't get experimental probability yet. And that's a really good thing for students to be able to talk about their learning in that way. So like I said before, teachers do this very differently and I've spent a lot of time looking at different people's work to design this. So this is modified and adapted from other people's work. Um, I give students this at the beginning of each case study. Right now I'm teaching probability. My learning targets are broken into different big categories, problem solving, representation, um, reasoning and proof, communication and connections. And those are from a network um, rubric that we use for another type of assessment. So I first, as a teacher, decide what learning targets are important. So in my probability class for our first case study, which is the language we use for units, I give them these um, learning targets. This is our goals for that first case study, four weeks about. And I give students this. So our goal is to learn these three concepts. We spend three or four weeks learning these things, normally through games and problem solving. And then every Friday, I give students a mastery opportunity. And this is to show what they know. You notice a few differences from maybe traditional assessments. The first is it's learning targets at the top, right? So all the questions are broken up by learning targets. And students receive this every Friday for the four or five weeks of the semester, or for the four or five weeks of the case study. And then when that case study is over, they can still work on this, um, this content we're moving on in class, but if they wanna come after school and retake these, that's great. And again, there's no penalty, I take their best score. And so I can see what students know and they have the opportunity to feel confident about what they know as well. Just a few challenges. Um, this process is really easy with discrete skills, but it's hard to assess something like problem solving. And I really don't know how to assess problem solving yet. Um, so that's a big question for me. It doesn't always measure retention or application. You could design your assessments to be more of an application. Um, I choose not to for this part of my assessment. And then as with any assessment, it's only a sample of what students know or don't know. So we're always getting incomplete um, information when we're assessing, and this doesn't fix that totally. So 
I think I might have time for a few questions, if anyone has questions. I um, thank you, Abby. I just uh, one of the things I appreciated about your presentation is I don't know how other schools operate, but our school board has a policy that you cannot factor behavior into a student's grade. And so I what I like about your approach is that it's focusing on what kids know, not how they behave in class. Um, we obviously know that at some point we will factor a certain level of behavior into a student's grade because if they don't show up. We can't assess their, their learning, um, but it's neat that you're trying to remediate or fix that, that dilemma that, that we have and that math teachers, I think, in general fall into that whole, you know, 70%, 80%, zeros in the grade book for every homework assignment miss that just kill a kid's grade and brings it down to hopelessness, you know? And so your mastery approach is really... Um, which is really refreshing to see. I'll just add, at my school, we have 60% attendance at transfer school. That's one of our challenges. And so I have students who have maybe 30% attendance, but actually know a lot of the content and are able to get it. Um, and I think in a traditional assessment system, these students wouldn't pass. And that, this is one of the reasons they haven't passed in their other high schools. And they're not earning credit, even though they know the content. So. I think it's really valuable to give credit to what students do know. If these are the things I think are important for students to know, and they know it, they should pass my class, right? Yeah, abs no, absolutely. And, um, you know, having taught pre-algebra for almost 20 years, um, in the school I'm in right now is 90% attendance rate, 95% uh, attendance rates, you know, middle to high income, super easy place to exist, right? And when I taught pre-algebra, um, at a low-income school for 10 years, uh, it was largely male and largely non-white, even though that wasn't representative of the population. And so I think that's an example of how some of these kids get all the way to high school and they're in a math class based on their behavior, not on their knowledge. Is, is one, and then they're putting that track. And, okay, anyway, I'm not going to go off on, on that tangent. Your other thing was about problem solving. And I think I've seen some good, like, observation checklists or rubrics out there um, that you've probably seen as well. And I think that it's really time-consuming to assess uh, problem solving or anything via a checklist or an observation. But maybe it could be developed into a student self-assessment you know, where they self-assess themselves based on that checklist or rubric? I have a question about how much time after school. I mean, with 160 students thinking about them retesting um, or retaking things after school is kind of overwhelming to me. Um, because a lot of them would choose to do that. How, how, do you, how do you work with that? I think that's one of the reasons that I've embedded it so frequently into the class. So every Friday it's another opportunity. So they get three or four chances in class. Um, I don't have that problem of too many students wanting to come after school. I have like maybe a a few students who want that perfect four on everything each semester, so it's very manageable. I think you'd have to maybe reconsider how to either structure it in class or maybe you get, I don't know, yeah, I'm not sure how to deal with that problem. Or that, that's a good problem to have, but that situation. Cool, thank you so much, Abby. That's our 10 minutes. So more questions if people want to email our presenters. If presenters are okay with that, we can do that for more questions. And if at the end we're done and we get everybody covered and we still have time, we can come back to it. Uh, so Abby, if you can stop sharing your screen and Irene, you're up. Can you see that? Can you see, can you see my screen? I can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I did a little practice earlier, so 
I'm uh, a little bit nervous. <laughs> Uh, I started doing this in year 2014, and when I attended the PCMI, I shared this, and I got something from PCMI where we were focusing on structure. So when I got these materials, yeah, I, the straws and connectors, because I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna jump on to the straws and connectors, but my uh, really, main focus is how can I use this uh, strokes and connectors to develop algebraic thinking. And I use these uh, definitions as reference to what would be the evidences that I should see from my students so that I know they are thinking algebraically. Then I came up with this like I know when my students are thinking algebraically when they can search for and recognize pattern and structure, collect and organize data, write equivalent expressions and equations, write ruling words and symbols, grab and use equations to solve real problems. Now, I focus on one thing. How can I develop among my students the skill of being able to, genera to generalize a pattern with fluency? So, these materials like in the beginning, I just was uh, fascinated with these toys just to play. And then I started using this with my middle schooler. And the initial objective that I, I had was to develop social learning skills because they don't know how to communicate with each other and they don't want to share space. So I think of let me make them build, you know, something and let them share the space. So they seem to be happy, like, oh, they're not fighting, sharing little space. And then I just let them play. And then I started, let me just show the picture before I show the slide, so I'm not going to be jumping with other, you know, take time to sh jump to another slide. So I'll just... I uh, did this with the middle schooler, and then I also did this with the adult. These are pictures of my students in adult education. The, uh, the ages are 21 and above. I have 60 year old, 22, 23, 45. And it was amazing. Like I discovered like when they count, it was not systematic. So they get confused. But when I said, if you can count systematically, you can develop the, the pattern and the formula. And then I let them build different, you know, shapes. And then later on, they asked me to do this with adult ed teachers this time. Because when they do workshop, they're always sitting down. And they see that, oh, with that, they can stand up and, you know, and work together as a team. And social learning skills also among adults can be developed. And then lastly, I did this with the Math for America teachers. And they seem to have fun too. So I started with this simple straws and connectors. That's line segments, but I use straws and connectors. So my students can touch it, can disconnect it, can connect them, and they can hold it when they count it. And then I focus on the way they should count the dots and the strokes systematically and write the equivalent expressions. When they write the equivalent expression, they can establish the pattern and then they can come up with a formula in the end. So this one, two dots, every stage has two dots in the beginning and then you're adding one, Two, zero, first, and then one, two. This one, you, you make the first that consistently there, make it like it's always there in every figure number, each number, and you're increasing it by one, two, and three. And in any way you count it, as long as you are being consistent, you can establish the formula. And there are many patterns where my kids work and 
Later on, they developed the skill of writing equivalent expressions. They work as a group, and then it is extended to functions. So there are a lot of concepts that can be developed with the use of these tools. And it's so hard to count when you have three-dimensional, if it is just a drawing. But if you have a tangible thing where they can systematically count and hold it, they can develop the pattern and they can develop the formula. And it, they can now perform developing or generalizing for more complicated figures. So these are the, I develop worksheets. I have a lot of worksheets with different pattern and they keep on practicing on that. And then we also extend it to, like if you have this equation here, one quadratic and one linear, and then we are developing the concept of a system of equations. So before I was just like looking at this as like simple pattern, and now it becomes more complicated as I will keep on working. So this is still in progress. And with a sixth grade student being able to come up with this work, and I just wonder how these skills can help them when they go to high school and go to college. Like, will they be able to generalize a pattern if they can systematically count and represent this counting system in order and then develop the pattern, develop the, the formula. And then I found this structure here and I saw my strokes and connectors. So I can connect now my strokes and connectors solving a problem like this, like how many panels and how many connectors do I need in order to form, you know, a, a cube square divider and organizer, two by two, three by three, four by four. And I saw this also on uh, the images from uh, a certain website and I saw this kind of figure too. Oh, this is also something that I can connect with my strokes and connectors. So it's still in progress. I am seeing a lot of things. I am seeing a lot of math, but I just don't have time to really work on it. But maybe if I focus on it, I could see a lot of mathematical concepts that can be developed. So far, these are my findings that to develop formula, a consistent systematic counting can help. Objects may be counted in different ways, but as long as it is done systematically and consistently, patterns can be established. Skill in writing equivalent expression, numbers can be written in an infinite number of ways. It can be interpreted as, you, as used in a context of real life situation. It only makes sense when we're written in such a way that you can relate the number with the real objects and the operation symbol with the process in counting the objects. And of course, with the strokes and connectors, I think these are the skills that can be developed. Mathematical concepts and, and you know, mathematical skills, processing skills, communicating skills, listening and reading skills, visualizing skills, manipulating skills, social learning skills. And of course, when you are working in a group within a group, leader skill, leadership skills, <laughs> also develop. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ah. That was great. Thank you. I like that using the straws and connectors to build those. I just finished going over sequences and patterns with my, uh, I teach math for elementary education teachers. So we go over, you know, elementary school math and finding patterns and sequences. And I wish I had seen this before to get them to actually do it and touch them as opposed to just looking at the pictures. So awesome. Thanks, Irene. Thank you. You have any question? Irene, there was also a question in the chat if you are willing to share your worksheets. Yes. 
I am. I have a lot. I can show you if we have time, just one piece like this one. Irene, if you have like a link to share or anything you want to share, you want to new share, and I say new share, right? Yeah. All yep. Right. Send anything to me, and then we'll get it posted to the web page for everybody to see. Can you see? You see something? So, so if Irene emails this to you, Liz, you can like have have it uploaded to the website. Yep. I'll have everything uploaded to the PCMY website. It'll be under the reconnect sessions under today's. We'll, we'll put links for everything there. Yep. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Irene and Gail. Thanks for waiting patiently. I know we're well behind schedule today, uh, but take it away. So Irene, if you stop screen sharing and then Gail, you can screen share. <laughs> Just Gail, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, these are for Sunny. There's some pictures of five-sided dice I thought you might like. And um, what I'm going to do today is just share a game that I played with my students called Building Fences. It builds teamwork and some math skills, and it was something that I used because I liked the game of 24, but um, I wasn't as crazy about it as some teachers, and it seemed like either you were really, really good at it or you really weren't good at it, and there weren't like multiple entry levels, so I developed this game. Um, and the way you start is you choose four digits, to fill the blanks. And I usually played it first as a whole class kind of activity. So I had two different groups, um, usually boys and girls, because they seem to like that com competition. So they would alternate numbers. And I used colors so that they could easily see who did what on the board. And the next step is you take turns using at least two of the digits to reach one of the numbers on the board. Um, and you could use two or three or four of the digits. So, but you couldn't say like nine and find nine on the board. So for example, the red team might say nine plus one plus two plus five equals 17. And they get points by how many numbers they use. So if they use all four numbers, they get a bonus point of five. And the second team then said, oh, I want to do five times two plus one. That gives me 11. They used three numbers, so they got three points. And then the next group said, oh, I want to do nine minus five squared. So they got three points. However, because they have an adjacent square that's their color, it doubles their points to six. So they, there's a little strategy. You have to try to get certain numbers. And the purple team didn't want them to get another double, so they found 2 plus 1 subtracted from 5 times 9 to get 18. And that gave them 5 points, but they've also blocked um, the other team. And the reason I liked this game better than 24 was there were multiple entry points. Kids that really were only comfortable adding and subtracting could try to do that. Um, kids that wanted to use exponents or square roots could do that. The ones that um, had never thought about using square roots were like, oh. And it was really neat when somebody would use the square root of zero, or not the square root of zero, the exponent of zero to get the number one, then everybody wanted to use that. So um, they, they became pretty 
interested in which numbers they should choose at the beginning of the game as well. Um, it, I think it builds computational fluency. I let them use calculators, but some of them discovered that the kids that were doing it mentally were doing it quicker than the ones that were using calculators. So that was encouraging. Um, it provided order of operation practice because they wrote the expressions down and then if it wasn't exactly written correctly, somebody would point it out to them. But that's you know, not what you said. It encourages strategic thinking and it supports teamwork. Um, I would, after I'd introduced this and we played it, and I, I usually started with a small group who were interested in playing, um, maybe the last five minutes of class while we were waiting for dismissal to happen for the buses. Um, and then more and more kids would sort of, at first reluctantly, and you could watch them all looking, and then suddenly they, oh, they had an idea and they wanted to share their answer. So it got kind of cool the way they would talk to each other about what numbers they should choose. Um, and it's really adaptable. I mean, I put the numbers 11 through 34 on this grid, but you could start with one or any number you wanted. Um, or you could even use negatives. Or I, I guess there's, you know, there are no building fences police out there. You could actually put any numbers you wanted on the board. So... And that's it. Um, that was longer than I thought it would be. <laughs> that's fantastic. I do something similar. My mom years ago found us this game and it was, I'll have to see if I can find a picture of it. I don't remember the name of it. It was like math forum or something uh, where the center dice is a 10 digit dice and there's, there's two black dice and it's kind of like a Yahtzee. And you shake the dice, and you have to use the five dice on the outside to get up to whatever it happens to roll. Sometimes there's multiple ways to do it. Sometimes there's only one. So it's just like this. And I used to have that sitting on my desk when I taught the high school. And if there were, you know, five minutes or a study hall, the kids would fight over getting to play the to with the toy to see who could figure it out. And it was the same thing, noticing like, oh, I can use exponents. But they couldn't use a square root unless they could write it as an exponent. So that... Awesome. I like that a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. I love your idea about using it at the end of a class for, you know, that if there's like a few minutes even that it's like, well, you know, it's, it's just a few minutes. I love that idea. I may even do that with my higher level cat classes. Um, I was thinking, oh, it'd be perfect for seventh grade curriculum and such. But then I was like, shoot, forget that. I could do that with any class. They'll have fun. Are, are we allowed to have fun during math? Uh, every once in a while, huh? Every once in a while. Thanks. And Gail, would you mind sharing that file as well? Is it? Uh, oh, yeah. Awesome. I'd be happy to. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm done. Ooh, this was the game. So you, you shook it around and the black dice, it was whatever their sum is. You have to use the other five dice to get there. So magic mixer is what it was. And I know you can still find it. I actually wanted to order it when I taught at the high school. And I was told because we didn't order it, it didn't come from an official school supply store. We weren't allowed to. Um, but if you guys have it, my students absolutely loved this. I've also used it for just, uh, I held a information like we called it mathletics at the community college on one of our kind of convocation days and the groups of students that came in. So they loved it. We did it with the faculty and staff. So it's very similar to what Gail was saying, but it, they can kind of do it on their own as well. I'm going to try to end my screen share. And Liz, I just found it on Amazon for $12 and 51 cents. It oh, does qualify wow. for Amazon Prime. Ah. Don't everyone go at once though. It only has 11 left in stock. And how? 
What am I doing here? That's basically Sorry. one for each of us, though, so that's all right. <laughs> Good point. So if Liz already has hers, we're, we're set. That, that's right. one, <laughs> limit one each. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. This was, I think, a great, fantastic session. I apologize. I know we got off late. Um, I'll, I'll blame myself because I had my little situation of running, sprinting through the snow to get my dog. So I was a little late getting everything started this morning as well. So thanks for bearing with us and giving us your morning. Sunny, thanks for being here so bright and early. Kel, we're glad you were able to uh, come in and kind of spy on us. Yeah. I noticed you didn't want a video with us, but that's okay. We're still happy to have you. And Beth, I'm so happy you could come in and sit in as well. And I will get all of this posted. There will be, the recording will also get uploaded probably early next week. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just send us an email. Thanks so much, everybody. Great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.